start with my lecture now about EPR spectroscopy. Um, you've seen in the past few lectures already many EPR spectra and also quite a bit of the underlying theory. So I will not tell many new things today. In fact, I will tell about EPR spectroscopy only on a very basic level. Um, so I hope it's still useful for some of the people in the audience. But be aware that uh, yeah, most of the things you will see on the slide you have actually heard already in, in the previous talks. So, what I want to do is give you a brief and basic introduction to EPR spectroscopy. And this encompasses first a reminder what is a spectroscopy in general with perturbation and response. We all know EPR stands for electron paramagnetic resonance, so I want to introduce you again to paramagnetism, um, radicals and metal centers, what EPR spectroscopy has to do with electronic structure at all, and why it is such a powerful method to be combined with quantum chemical calculations. I will focus a little bit on the spin Hamiltonian parameters, spin Hamiltonian is a function been discussed already in great detail, in particular G values and hyperfine interactions. Uh, I decided to extend my lecture um, a little bit with uh, pulse EPR spectroscopy, so I tried to explain a little bit what we do with microwave pulses and flipping of the spins. And in the second part I will briefly give you two examples that relate the quantities that we can measure in EPR spectroscopy quantities that we can calculate and we'll focus on the zero field splitting which you also heard already a lot about and in general calculations of g-values with density functional theory. So just as a reminder, spectroscopy, maybe this is slightly too basic, but um, spectroscopy comes from the Latin word spectrum which means ghost or image and it is combined with the Greek word uh, scopein, which means to see. So with spectroscopy we do not look directly at the molecules, we look at the ghost or at the image of the molecule. And, um, what we basically do in spectroscopy is we make perturbations, we irradiate our molecules with light of various wavelengths and then we detect the response of the molecule. And to illustrate that, I have a Another basic example which I show to my bachelor students. So this is for example our molecule. You can see that our molecule has been geometry optimized. It's in the ground state. It's very heavy. And what we then do in spectroscopy, we apply a perturbation. And what you see is then that this molecule can respond. And depending on, for example, the size of the molecule or the identity of the molecule, this response will be different. Um, in particular, in EPR and in NMR spectroscopy, this response does not have to be instantaneous. We can, as we will see later, apply microwave pulses to the system. So we perturb our system and then it will take some time. So the molecule, maybe at first, does not respond, but then at some point the molecule will give its response. So that is basically a summary of what every spectroscopy is doing. We perturb our molecule and we detect the response. The difference in all the spectroscopies, as also Frank Meyer already mentioned in his opening lecture, is the wavelength or the frequency of the light which we use to perturb our system. As I've listed Basically, most of the methods that will be discussed or have been discussed already at this workshop are we with EPR. We are in the range of uh, microwaves. We perturb our system with microwaves. Typical wavelengths in, um, in the microwave region, I'm afraid that this should have been micrometer, um, are in the three Thirteen millimeters, three centimeter. No, it is correct. Three centimeter up to half a millimeter region. 
This corresponds to frequencies in the gigahertz range. So 9 gigahertz, for example, is a very well-known EPR frequency. It also is also comparable to the frequencies that your processor in the computer operates. It's also comparable to the frequency of the Andes and to the frequency used in the microwaves at home to heat the food. So what is EPR? Again, I apologize if it's too basic. EPR is the same as ESR, electron spin resonance or electron paramagnetic resonance. And what has been discussed already, um, we are dealing with paramagnetism, not to be confused with ferromagnetism. A ferromagnet, for example, a piece of iron, is a system where all the microscopic magnetic elements, all the spins are aligned and you get a macroscopic magnetic moment. In paramagnetic systems, for example, magnetic molecules in solution, each molecule is magnetic, as you can see here, but the interaction between the electron spins on different molecules is basically zero. So we have magnetic molecules, but we don't have a ordering of the magnetization in the solution. That's a paramagnetic system. Spin is, of course, a general property of most of the elementary particles, particularly also of the electron. The electron is a spin one half system. It can also be thought of a uh, little magnet with a north pole and a south pole. Um, I want to give you two examples, two experiments, that, two classical experiments that people have done in the past to detect uh, to detect the spin and to uh, visualize that something like spin must exist. A very famous example is the Stern-Gerlach experiment. In the Stern-Gerlach experiment, what these two people have done is they took a beam of neutral silver atoms. And the source, this, this transparency unfortunately is in German, but the source of the silver atoms is here. It's like a furnace, an oven, where the silver is heated and brought into the gas phase. And then it, the silver atoms are being directed to this magnet here. And this magnet actually is constructed in such a way that a field gradient exists along the Z direction. So by making the north pole of the magnet relatively narrow and the south pole rather broad, the field lines go from top to bottom like this. So along the z-direction, there are a lot of field lines in the top, there are less field lines in the bottom, so the field in the top is stronger than the field in the bottom, and you have a field gradient. And the force of the atoms is then rather trivially expressed as the gradient of the magnetic energy. So the magnetic energy is of course mu times e, the magnetic moments want to align themselves along the magnetic field direction. And in the case of silver atoms, we now have to consider the electronic configuration of silver. And neutral silver has one unpaired electron in the 5s orbital. So without including spin, there is no magnetism in neutral silver atom because the unpaired electron is in an s orbital. The s orbital does not have angular momentum. So what one would classically expect is that the silver atoms just go through this magnet with the field gradient and give a uniform non-deflected spot in the, uh, on the horizontal line where the silver atoms are traveling. What was observed is actually what you see here in the front is that we get two deflected spots, one slightly to the top, one slightly to the bottom. So it turned out that the silver atoms were deflected by the magnetic field gradient. And this is a first indication that something additional to the um, quantum numbers that belong to the Schrodinger equation, for example, exists that electrons have an additional magnetic moment. And this additional magnetic moment causes this, this occurrence of two spots in the Stern-Gerlach experiment. And then the spin can, of course, be aligned either parallel or anti-parallel to the magnetic field. A second experiment to show the existence of spin <coughs> from uh, atomic spectroscopy. 
A very famous example is sodium. Sodium has this electronic configuration, one unpaired electron in the 3s orbital. It's just an atom, so one expects the 3p orbital, so the, 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 the 3p shell, which is of course empty, that all the 3p orbitals are degenerate. So one expects the first excited state, where we promote this electron from the 3s to the 3p orbital, that there's only one possible transition. But in fact, if we look at the emission back from this excited state where the electron has been promoted to the 3p orbital, and the emission then goes back to the 3s orbital, in this emission, we did not, or people did not see one emission line, but in fact, two emission lines are present. And if one then additionally would also put, if one would put the sodium atoms in a magnetic field, these lines would even split, one line would split into four, and the other line would split into six lines, and that could of course classically not be explained at all. But it could be explained by assuming that an additional magnetic moment of the electron exists, or so spin, and this spin, spin in half of course for the electron, then couples together with the, <coughs> with the orbital angular momentum, so in the excited state with the 3p electron, an orbital angular momentum of 1. So if the spin and the orbital angular momentum couple parallelly together, we get a total spin of 3 half. And if they couple anti parallelly, uh, spin 1 uh, or an angular momentum 1 and an angular momentum 1 half, if they couple anti parallelly, we get total angular momentum 1 half. And if one then, for example, considers how these levels split in the magnetic field, we can completely explain the occurrence of four emissions in one line and six emissions from the um, total momentum three half level. This is called the, originally it was called the anomalous Zeeman effect. So the interaction of the electron spin with the magnetic field was originally called the anomalous Zeeman effect. Probably by now we should call it the normal Zeeman effect. But now, historically, this is how it was called. Um, paramagnetic systems are, in the first place, of course, molecules with unpaired electrons. Atoms of molecules with unpaired electrons. According to the Aufbau principle, where we have to start filling electron pairs into the lowest lying orbitals, uh, one can see already that these lowest lying doubly occupied orbitals do not really contribute to the magnetism, at least not to the electric mag electronic magnetism of the atom or the molecule. It's only the electrons that are unpaired, for example, the hydrogen atom is of course paramagnetic, only the unpaired electrons contribute to the electronic magnetism. So for atoms, one can think of atoms with uneven number of electrons, molecules basically the same. In general, a paramagnetic system is any atom or molecule or entity where unpaired electrons are present, and where additionally the spin coupling is such that the total electron spin is unequal to zero. So that is about spin and paramagnetic systems. Then resonance. Then we have pretty much explained all the words that are in EPR spectroscopy. Resonance is related to the fact that we will now put our sample into a magnet. This is a picture of a typical X-band EPR magnet. It's still an electromagnet. It's cooled with, with water. And it has these, these large copper coils that you see in the picture where the large um, magnetic field is created, typically about 3,000 Gauss, 0 0.3 Tesla. If we apply a magnetic field to the paramagnetic system, we get a Zeeman splitting. As you all know, you get possibility of aligning the electron, if you have a spin one half, the electron can be parallel or anti-parallel to the magnetic field, and the Zeeman splitting is linear with the strength of the magnetic field. So the larger the magnetic field, the larger the Zeeman splitting. The energy difference is basically two times the magnetic moment of the electron 
time stream magnetic field and the relationship between the magnetic moment of the electron and the electron spin is basically given either by this quantity gamma, which is called the gyromagnetic ratio, you will find that often in the literature, and also if we split off, <coughs> if we split off the Bohr magneton, we have here the G value. And this is one of the properties that have been discussed already, I guess, in the spin Hamiltonians. This is one of the spin Hamiltonian parameters that, in principle, can be measured and can also be calculated. If we then apply microwaves to our paramagnetic system, the microwaves, as you can see, can only be absorbed if the microwave energy, given time by Planck's constant times the frequency of the radiation if the microwave energy equals to this same one splitting here given either by 2 mu e0 or if we use the formula over here free electron g value times or magneton times magnetic field only then the system is able to absorb the microwave energy only then we can change the spin from parallel to anti-parallel and vice versa So I've now explained to you all the words that are in EPR, and now the question is, of course, what can uh, what can we do with it? To which systems are our, uh, EPR spectrometers generally used? I gave you here a few examples. Um, for example, molecular oxygen is a rather famous example. Molecular oxygen is actually a triplet state, not a singlet state. So the resonance structure one would have to draw like this. There are two unpaired electrons present on the oxygen, so oxygen can be detected by EPR spectroscopy. And I don't know if many people are aware, but even the quality of beer is tested by EPR spectroscopy. There are, of course, many fermentation processes involved where uh, radical species are created, and also the oxygen concentration in beer is monitored by PR spectroscopy and the firma, the company Brucker, somewhere in the south of Germany, another famous company, has uh, EPR spectrometers that they especially spell, sell to beer companies. It's called the ESCAN beer analyzer, for example. I thought that was a nice example of EPR spectroscopy, and maybe to add to that, all the, and we have all the alcoholic beverages finished for today. Um, Wine is actually monitored by NMR spectroscopy. So EPR is beer and NMR is wine. <laughs> um, one can use EPR spectroscopy before we go slightly more into the detail. One can use EPR spectroscopy also on a phenomenological level. If we have a very basic redox reaction, we have two reactants, two redox, A and B, we bring them together. One electron hops over from A to B, so we are left after the reaction, can give me equilibrium even, after the reaction we have a cationic A species and an anionic B species. If one electron hops over from A to B, that means that if A and B have an even number of electrons, then A plus and B minus both must have an uneven number of electrons. So in this very simple one electron redox chemistry, there's always EPR protected species involved. In the example that is given on this transparency, we actually use synchlorine E6 and benzoquinone. This is a nice system because it can be triggered by light if we put also our EPR tube in the magnet, and if we additionally then put a lamp in front of the magnet to illuminate the sample, we can just switch the light on. For example, at 220 Kelvin, and um, we can just watch our EPR signal grow in very quickly when we switch on the light, and of course it saturates at some point if you have an equilibrium reaction. Uh, if you switch the light off again, you see the EPR signal disappearing again, so the forward reaction is driven by light. If the light is switched off, the reaction goes back and the EPR signal disappears. If one starts to freeze the sample, one can study, I guess, in a very expensive way the kinetic of these reactions, or in this case, actually, the kinetics of the 
uh, or the viscosity of the solvent. Uh, when you lower the temperature, you see that everything slows down. If we switch the light on, the time constant is much slower. The radicals grow in uh, slower. The solution is almost frozen, it gets more viscous, so A and B have difficulty to find each other. One can, in principle, determine rate constants uh, by just using EPR spectroscopy on a phenomenological level. A more powerful example, related also more to theory, is just the electronic structure of radical species. Uh, one of the projects that we have performed in the past concerns cysteine radicals. In many radical enzymes, amino acid radicals play an important role as intermediates of the reaction. And in general, one would like to know where the unpaired electron in a molecule is. If you have molecules with unpaired electrons, then it's a very important question. Alternatively, slightly more correctly, is what is the wave function associated with the unpaired electron? And the reason why this is so important, if you remember the alpha principle, we have all our doubly occupied orbitals which are low in energy, and then we have eventually our singly occupied orbital which contains the electron which is associated with the highest energy. This electron with the highest energy is in general also the most labile electron of the system. So if one electron has to go away, it will be the unpaired electron. If one electron has to come, if the molecule gets reduced, it will be added to the orbital that already contains the unpaired electron. So in general, this unpaired electron is also the most reactive electron in the system. And additionally, it is the only electron that contributes to the magnetism. So and this is one of the main reasons why EPR spectroscopy is so powerful. In EPR spectroscopy, we generally do not see all the paired electrons, for example, this one in the CO bond. This electron pair does not contribute to the magnetism. And for problems in chemistry, if you want to uh, investigate reaction mechanisms, you will also not be particularly interested in the CO bond, which persists through the reaction. So the question of how to locate the unpaired electron is a very general question and EPR spectroscopy is a very powerful tool to help with that. And in this particular case of cysteine radical, it turns out that the unpaired electron is almost exclusively in a B orbital on the sulfur atom and that one of these one pair orbitals here is very nearly degenerate to the same occupied orbital. These are two example EPR spectra. We have seen the theory. If you put an electron in a magnetic field, you get the same on splitting, you can make transitions. If that would be the complete story, then EPR would be pretty boring and all EPR samples, uh, all samples would give the same EPR signal. You see that this is definitely not the case. If I measure EPR on this radical here, called the PNT radical, we actually see a very, very rich spectrum with many signals, many lines. Whereas if I burn a wooden match, for example, and if I put the, ash in, the ashes in my EPR tube, I just see a rather broad and structureless EPR signal that corresponds to carbon radicals. Um, the reason why these spectra are so different, we will get to that in a moment, that is of course the hyperfine interaction, not only the electron has magnetic moment, but also the protons. For example, the protons on this PNT radical have magnetic moments, and like we all know, I guess everybody or most of you played with magnets when you were a child, two magnets feel each other, also the electron spin and the proton spin, they interact with each other, and this is called the hyperfine interaction. So, why is EPR so useful? If you ask yourself the central question, can we understand a chemical reaction? And the answer, I guess, would be if you want to fully understand the chemistry, the reaction, one needs to know where the, ele where the active electrons are, and the electronic structure tell us where they come from and where they are going to. And uh, just to make a little bit of advertisement for the institute, these are the 
three methods that, that I occupy myself with most of the time. Brownian spectroscopy, of course, quantum chemistry, and EPR spectroscopy. So let's now dive a little bit more into the theory. On the one hand, we have our experiment, which I already showed you with the Zeeman splitting. On the other hand, we will now have to go through some equations. The magnetic energy is, of course, as already said, uh, given by the dot product of the magnetic moment times the magnetic field, which is just a mathematical translation that the magnetic moment prefers to be parallel to the magnetic field. If mu and b are parallel, this, this dot product is maximized with the minus sign in front, the energy is minimized. So this is just the mathematical translation that magnetic moments want to be parallel to the magnetic field. Magnetic moment and the spin are related by this, this, this g value. In this case, it is written for a free electron. The g value for the free electron is called the, I can't help it, the free electron g value. And if one puts that in a magnetic field, the Hamiltonian to describe that system is given here. So mu and s are linear. We just plug this into the Hamiltonian, we exchange the magnetic moment for the spin, that's the electron Zeeman interaction. And this leads to the Zeeman splitting given by this formula here, and pictorially it's uh, given on the left side. If this would be the complete story, then as said, EPR would be pretty boring. Every sample would give a signal at the free electron G value. Um, if one measures on a transition metal complex, for example, I showed you in the bottom of the figure an EPR spectrum for a nickel free system. You see that this is definitely not the case. We actually see three features, an absorptive feature at a G value of 2.20, uh, first derivative like signal at 2.15, and an emissive signal very close to 2.0, very close to the free electron G value. So it's certainly not the case that in molecules, this resonance condition with only the free electron G value is valid. Something more is going on. By the way, this is a picture of a typical EPR spectrometer. The box here on top of the, of the wooden table is called the microwave bridge. That is the source where the microwaves are generated. It's like the microwave oven of our spectrometer. And then it also contains the detector and that the microwaves are led to the middle of the magnet where the sample is located. The sample can absorb and emit microwaves and the microwaves then subsequently go back into the bridge where we measure just how many microwaves are coming back. So back to our G values. The theory is slightly more involved and we unfortunately have to do a little bit of perturbation theory. If we now look into the magnitudes of the interactions that, that the electron or, or the energy uh, that the electrons are associated with. One can basically split them up into large energies and small energies. And this is a very convenient way because one can then do perturbation theory for the small energies and one has to do something else for the large energies. So the electrons, of, of course, they have kinetic energy. They are attracted by the nuclei and they are repelled by electron-electron uh, -electron repulsion, of course. These are energies if one would, um, if one would um, calculate the energies of the Born-Oppenheimer Hamiltonian. These are energies that lie, into the vis lie in the visible region. For example, 20,000 wave numbers, 500 nanometers, these are the transitions that we see. EPR spectroscopy, as said, is around 9 gigahertz. 9 gigahertz correspond to 0.3 wave numbers. So 4 to 5 orders of magnitude smaller than the energies that come out of the Born-Oppenheimer Hamiltonian. And in this respect, we have a very natural perturbation parameter in our system, which separates the large interactions from the small interactions. So the small interactions, they contain the electron Zeeman interaction with the free electron G value, but there are two other interactions that we have to consider. If the electron 
maybe in an orbital, for example, B orbital, which is associated with orbital angular momentum, we have to take into account the orbital Zeeman interaction, given by something like orbital angular momentum parameter, uh, orbital angular momentum operator times the magnetic field. And additionally, there's also a spin-dependent interaction, which is called spin-orbit coupling, which basically couples the spin of an electron, given by S, and the orbital momentum of the electron, given by L, together. And if we would do second-order perturbation theory, in second order, if we would take the um, product of this Hamilton operator H2 times H3, which if one remembers the uh, expression for second order perturbation theory, then the perturbing Hamilton operator occurs twice. If we take the product of H2 times H3, we see that we have something linear in S, and we also have something linear in B. So the product would be something like S times L squared times B. But the important thing is we have, again, a linearity with the electron spin and the magnetic field. So in second-order perturbation theory, this cross-term of spin-orbit coupling and the orbital Zeeman interaction looks like a Zeeman splitting. And that contributes to the G value and gives rise, for example, to this splitting in the EPR spectrum with three G values. Um, if one does this, this, this perturbation theory treatment, which is basically the field of, uh, of, of ligand field theory, um, depending on how the ligands of the around the nickel atom are, uh, are oriented, depending on the symmetry of the ligand field, the set of 5D orbitals splits up, as has been discussed already in the uh, ligand field theory talks. <coughs> And depending on how these d orbitals are split up, the unpaired electron, if we again start just to fill the orbitals, ends up either in the dc squared orbital or in the x squared minus y squared orbital, wherever. And one can, from the theory, derive expressions now for the gx, gy, and gz values, these three values that we can measure directly in the experiment. And one can do that for many possibilities. For example, this is the possibility where the unpaired electron is actually in a dc squared orbital. If one does second order perturbation theory, it's really not that difficult. If one calculates these matrix elements, one sees that one uh, g value, the gc value, is actually still close to the free electron g value, which is exactly what we have measured. One g value is still close to 2.0023. And the other two G values, they are shifted away from the free electron G value. So if one measures an EPR spectrum like this, and if one has some experience with Lingen field theory, again, Lingen field theory is a very powerful tool just to understand what is going on in your system. If one sees an EPR spectrum with three G values like this, one G value close to the free electron G value, two of them are shifted then we know immediately, aha, uh -huh, this is a system where the unpaired electron is in the DC squared orbital, and it tells us something about the ligand field around the nickel. Right, this was the expression for, the general expression for second order perturbation theory, when you see that this perturbing Hamilton, Hamiltonian comes in twice, and the Additional term that comes from H2 times H3. So, back to um, our EPR spectrum. Um, we've now talked about G values. Um, what we see here in these EPR experiments are a spectra that are more complicated because of another interaction, in particular the hyperfine interaction. The hyperfine interaction is related to the nuclear spins, as already said. The P and T radical, even though they are not drawn here, has protons, whereas the carbon radicals after I wear my mesh, they might not necessarily have protons or water nearby because, um, because of the process that, that, uh, that happens. So, 
If two spins, if two dipole moments are near to each other, they feel each other, they have a dipole-dipole interaction. And the formula for the dipole-dipole energy is given here. Looks rather complicated. It contains the magnetic moment of the electron, the magnetic moment of the proton. There's a distance dependence. Even though this formula looks rather complicated, we all know this formula from playing with magnets from our early days, so to say. If we have two magnets next to each other, they want to be aligned anti-parallel. And of course, if one increases the distance between the two magnets, as is given on this one over r to the third and one over r to the fifth, if r becomes larger, we all know from our previous days that the interaction between the magnets becomes smaller. That is given by this one over r to the third, one over r to the fifth dependence. And of course, if two magnets are oriented like this in parallel, then the magnetic moments also want to be oriented parallelly. This is all expressed mathematically in this formula. It's nothing else than what we all know already a long time. The important thing, however, is that there is a distance dependence on this hyperfine interaction. As the effective distance between the electron and the proton increases, the hyperfine interaction becomes, becomes smaller. And this distance dependence gives us a way, if we could measure the size of the, or the magnitude of this hyperfine interaction, if we could measure that, we would have information about the effective distance of the electron and the proton. Stated differently, we would have information about the location of the unpaired electron, or theoretically more correct, we would have information about the orbital of the unpaired electron. So this hyperfine interaction is very useful to measure the whereabouts of the unpaired electron. Um, the coupling of the electron spin and the nuclear spin lead to slight complications of our Zeeman splitting. Our Zeeman splitting with just the unpaired electron was given by these two levels, as we have already seen. We now have the complication, or my complication, the addition, that we also have to take into account the nuclear Zeeman splitting. Of course, much smaller than the electron Zeeman splitting. This picture is not to scale. So, in EPR spectroscopy, we have typically 9 gigahertz. From NMR spectroscopy, you know the frequency. It's on the order of several hundred megahertz if you do NMR spectroscopy. So, this transition is about three orders of magnitude. This energy difference is about three orders of magnitude smaller than this energy difference. So, this picture is not to scale. And additionally, to the nuclear Zeeman interaction, we have the hyperfine interaction that on the top brings the two levels closer together. And in the bottom part of the picture, actually, if one goes through the mathematics, it pulls the two levels away from each other. If we then consider how many EPR transitions are possible, then one sees that uh, depending on how many protons or how many nuclear spins are, are present, the uh, single EPR resonance gets split up. For example, this is for the hypothetical case of an electron spin one half and a nuclear spin two. The EPR spectrum that one would measure would look something like this. In this case, there are five EPR allowed transitions instead of only one. And one then goes back to the EPR spectrum that we actually measured. One actually sees that something similar is going on. So this, this splitting of the EPR resonance is related to the interaction of the many protons that are attached to the PT radical. What can one additionally do with EPR spectroscopy? So EPR is a rather versatile tool, a versatile spectroscopy. In EPR spectroscopy, and I hope to have shown you already that we can study dynamics and kinetics. We can determine the principal rate constants just by phenomenological use of EPR as a diagnostic method. We can determine <coughs> information about the electronic structure, distances, as already explained, also orientations. Remember that the hyperfine interaction, the dipole-dipole interaction, has an orientation dependence. Like this, the spins want to be anti-parallel. Like this, the spins want to be 
parallel, so there's distance information in EPR spectroscopy. And the modern EPR spectroscopist uses EPR spectroscopy in a pulsed form. So the most classic EPR experiment that one can do is a pulsed EPR experiment where actually two microwave pulses are irradiated and the sample then eventually gives its response indicated in yellow. And this is called the echo. We will get to that in a moment. EPR spectroscopy is a spectroscopy that is typically a time resolution on the nanosecond time scale. So it's quite fast, but it's of course unfortunately not as fast as the fastest optical methods that are available. But if you have reactions that are on the order of nanoseconds or slower, one can in principle study them by EPR. If they are faster, no chance. So we can do EPR spectroscopy, of course, at higher magnetic fields with increased Seyman interaction, which increases our spectral resolution. We can also measure relaxation times of the electron spins. So if we give microwave pulses to flip the spin, to move them away from the large magnetic field, we can measure how long it takes for the spins to go back by themselves. These are called relaxation measurements. There are two time constants called T1 and T2 that are particularly important in that respect. We can measure them. We have the possibility to measure these hyperfine interactions, very important for the electronic structure. There are a multitude of me uh, methods available. You will find in the literature these acronyms, so I don't want to bother you too much with the details of the call scheme, but I just want to show you the acronyms. In the literature you will often find terms like e or I-score spectroscopy, so these are pulsed EPR techniques. And a few slides later, I will tell about Endor spectroscopy. Endor stands for electron nuclear double resonance. So we apply in this Endor technique not only microwave pulses to flip the electron, we also apply an NMR pulse to flip the nuclear spin directly. And because the electron spin and the nuclear spin, they are coupled together by this hyperfine interaction, the flipping of the nuclear spin is partially felt by the electron spin and vice versa if we flip the electron spin, the nuclear spin also knows what's going on because they are coupled. So by doing this, this hybrid EPR and NMR experiments, we can actually measure the, the magnitude of the hyperfine interaction. There's a triple resonance experiment that I don't go into detail, but I just want to mention it, where we can in principle determine signs of the interactions, whether they are positive or negative. Another field that is very important if you do not have one unpaired electron, but more unpaired electrons, for example in a dye radical, if you have two unpaired electrons, like the one in oxygen, for example, no, that example, if they are quite far away, then one can, in principle, measure the distance between two electron spins. For very strong hyperfine interactions, think for example of a transition metal, where most of the unpaired electron density usually is in transition metal complexes, the hyperfine interaction of the unpaired electrons with the nuclear spin of the central metal can be measured by a technique called Elder Detected NMR. This is a good method for measuring very strong hyperfine interactions. I'm going to bother you now with, again, some formula. They are not in the script. I will try to go over them very quickly just to tell you about the mathematics of EPR spectroscopy and what happens if we put a spin in a magnetic field and then if we apply microwaves. So, uh, from electromagnetism, we actually know the equation of motion for a magnetization in a magnetic field. If I call the magnetization capital M, if I put a system which has a magnetization in a magnetic field, then the magnetization starts to move, given by this, this first time derivative, and the way it's moving is given by this equation of motion. It's actually given by the vector product of the magnetization itself, vector product with the magnetic field. So if I draw this pictorially, if I have my magnetization and my magnetic field not necessarily parallel, then my change of the magnetization, dm, is actually perpendicular to m itself and also perpendicular to 
the magnetic field because of this vector product here. That means if dm is perpendicular to m and b, that m actually makes a precession, a precession motion around the magnetic field. That's what magnetization does if one puts it in the magnetic field. We can then determine the frequency by which the um, magnetization is rotating. This is again the equation of motion. We can, we have to go through a little bit of mathematics. We have defined here this in red, this important quantity R. And we can now look at this, this rotation, which I call the phi. And if I consider the, uh, yeah, the infinitesimal change in phi, so d phi, I can write that mathematically as the infinitesimal change dm divided by this, this vector r. This is basically the definition of, of radiance. And one can set up several more equations. For example, this quantity r, just from goniometrics, r is equal to the length of m times the sine of this angle alpha. And if I just write the vector product out, I get something like this. I can then move my dt from the left side of the equation of motion to the right side. I just write it slightly differently. So dm equals then gamma m d dt sine alpha, where I substituted the vector product for this expression. And then uh, I substitute 2 and 4 into equation 1 to derive an expression for d phi. And one sees many properties, many, uh, many quantities drop out. The sine alpha drops out, the magnetization itself drops out. And d phi equals just this, this quantity gamma times the magnetic field times dt. If I move dt from the right to the left, I have my precession frequency. How my angle is changing with time is given by a constant. Which constant is that? It's the gyromagnetic ratio times the magnetic field. This is the frequency with which the magnetization is precessing. It's precessing linearly with the magnetic field, and it's given by the product of the magnetization, uh, gyromagnetic ratio, and the magnetic field. Mathematically, um, to prepare you for the next transparency where we actually start to, uh, to apply microwaves. Mathematically, it makes a lot of sense to go to a rotating exosystem that rotates around this magnetic field direction with the same frequency as the magnetization is precessing. So, if our magnetization is, for example, rotating around a stable here with a certain frequency, if our exosystem or if we are rotating with the same frequency, then in our exosystem the magnetization is standing still. Mathematically, this is quite involved. One has to deal with first time derivatives of the general factors in the laboratory exosystem and in the rotating exosystem, where not only the components of the vector have first time derivatives, but also the unit vectors now start to rotate. Uh, one can work that out mathematically and derive an equation for this rotation of the magnetization in the rotating frame. It's actually equal to the rotation of the magnetization in the laboratory frame times uh, minus this term omega uh, cross product m, where omega is large omega is the frequency by which our frame is rotating. For the MDT, we know what the MDT is. This is just given by the equation of motion. M cross gamma B, as we have seen. If we substitute that, then the first time derivative of the magnetization in the rotating frame is actually equal to this expression. And one sees if the frequency by which our rotating frame is moving, if large omega is equal to small omega, then this term here becomes zero. This is just a mathematical translation that if something's rotating and we are rotating along with it, then it's in our observation it's standing still. 
So why do we do this is maybe a rather complicated exercise of going to a rotating frame. It has advantages if we now apply a microbe field. If we are in equilibrium, for example, we have our large field from our magnet, our B0 field, let's say this is the z-axis, B0 field is along the z-axis, let's say our magnetization has come into equilibrium, it wants to be oriented along this magnetic field, and what happens now if we apply an oscillating field in the xy plane, so the magnetic field component of our microwave field has to be in the xy plane. We can actually write a oscillating field, for example, along the x direction as two oscillating fields, one rotating clockwise, EL, and one rotating counterclockwise, BR. If BL and BR are moving with the same frequency over 360 degrees, then the sum of BR and BL is just this linear magnetic field along the x direction. We can include this into our uh, equation of motion. So how the magnetization is changing this time in the rotating frame because we can make use of the fact that if we um, use a rotating frame where the uh, rotation frequency is either the same with BR or BL, so the frequency by which our frame is rotating is either the same with uh, the R or L component that is rotating, we can just add this in the rotating frame as German magnetic ratio times magnetic moment times this time in one field along the x direction of the rotating frame. So the x direction here is not the x direction of our laboratory axis, it's the x direction of the rotating frame. If then additionally the resonance condition is fulfilled, I think this is on the next transparency, if the resonance condition is fulfilled, so Zeeman splitting equals microwave frequency, that's basically what it says here. Microwave frequency, Zeeman splitting, if they are equal, then we see that this whole first term drops out because this, this difference becomes zero. And the equation of motion of the magnetization in the rotating frame is just given by this relatively easy term here at the end, proportional to, again, the magnetization and the B1 field along the x direction. We have already seen what happens. The equation of motion is one where the magnetization rotates, <coughs> rotates around the magnetic field direction. In this case, the B1 is along x. So in our rotating frame, our magnetization makes actually a precession motion in the yz plane. And that's basically what happens if we apply microwaves to the system. If we now give microwaves, not continuously, but in pulsed form, we can, for example, start applying our microwave and the magnetization is still in equilibrium along the z-axis. Then we apply our microwaves according to the equation of motion, m starts to precess from z to y. And once m has reached the y-axis, we just switch off our microwaves again. So we turn them on only for a period of time until the magnetization has rotated by 90 degrees, and then we just switch it off. This is called a 90 degree pulse. So if one goes through the mathematics, it might look somewhat involved, but if one goes through it, it's also not that difficult. Uh, if, you apply, if you apply the microwave for a defined period of time, you can accomplish defined rotation angles of the magnetization. So 90 degree pulse, uh, pictorially, looks something like this. We have a time axis, we at some point switch on our microwaves, we wait a little bit, then we switch them off again. And if we do that uh, for a long enough time, we can actually flip our magnetization from Z to Y. We can also do that with a pulse that is two times longer. If the pulse is two times longer, we have a so-called 180 degree pulse, we rotate our magnetization from Z to minus C. This way we can manipulate not only the 
electrons spin, but in principle also an NMR spectroscopy, it works exactly the same. One can uh, induce changes of the magnetization and one can basically put the magnetization in any direction that one wants. There's a slight complication because after we switch our microwaves off, for example, in the 90 degree pulse, when the magnetization is then along Y, then the magnetization is no longer in equilibrium. So if I have moved my magnetization from Z to Y, it then just starts to precess around the Z direction because remember we still have our strong magnetic field along the Z direction. So the magnetization is just starting to precess around the Z axis. However, microscopically, since we're dealing with a paramagnetic system, some of the spins might go slightly faster, depending on how the molecules oriented in the magnetic field. If we have a solution, then all orientations are present. The precession frequencies might be slightly different. So, after switching off the pulse, when the magnetization goes from Y to minus X, there might be fast spins indicated in green, and there might be slow spins indicated in orange. So the, um, the microscopic um, phase coherence is starting to become lost, so to say. The fast spins just go faster. One can think this of runners that are starting to run <laughs> counterclockwise. There are fast runners that yeah, become ahead of the slow runners. So the micro, on the microscopic level, there is a loss of phase coherence. If one detects the signal, one actually sees a oscillating signal that, that looks like this. This is typically a signal where we detect the magnetization in the horizontal plane, for example, along the minus y direction or the plus y direction. Then one sees this, this, this oscillation, which is a result of, of this, this precession motion. But also one sees that this oscillation is damped because of this defacing of the fast and the slow spins. This is called free induction decay. One can play a very nice trick. One can apply a 90 degree pulse. We flip the magnetization into the XY plane. It starts to deface. And what we then do is we apply a 180 degree pulse. We have seen a 180 degree pulse flips the fast, the fast spins, my right arm, and the slow spins, both by 180 degrees. And now I have to do something impossible. So the fast spins go 180 degrees here, and the slow spins go 180 degrees in the other direction. It's basically like flipping a pancake or blowing a whistle and telling all the runners, now you have to run in the other direction. Uh, what then happens is, is fast spins that were in front, as they were still rotating counterclockwise, now I have to start running into the other direction. Um, actually, they are running here in the same direction. I'm sorry for that. Um, by this flipping of 180 degrees, the fast spins get from here to here. The slow spins get from here to here. Sorry, I don't know how to explain it. In, more detail. Anyways, the order of the fast and the slow spins is reversed. And then they continue to run, and then eventually the fast spins can catch up to the slow spins again. So this defacing <coughs> process that happened after the 90 degree burst is inverted, and then a refacing takes place. And at the time after the second pulse, typically called tau, which is exactly the same as the time between the first and the second pulse, the refacing is complete, and then all of a sudden the um, paramagnetic sample starts to emit microwaves again. This is called an echo signal, and that was related to the pictures that I showed you in the beginning, where we can perturb our system, and then it will take some time before the response can be detected, but eventually it can be. So the ETR spectrum is actually an uh, experiment where we scan magnetic field on the x-axis, so we change the signal splitting by scanning the magnetic field. We do the experiment at a fixed frequency, and what we are actually detecting is the magnetization 
of our sample, so the microwaves that, that come back from our sample, but in, in, in uh, more technical detail, this is a pulsed EPR experiment, it looks like an absorption spectrum, and the magnetization, but we actually measure is the echo height. So this, this echo, this spontaneous emission of microwaves by the sample are just detected by the microwave bridge, and the intensity of that, the amplitude, is plotted on the vertical axis, and that's our EPR signal. We see the um, EPR signal on this experiment has only one resonance, so the resonance condition is only fulfilled if the microwave frequency equals the same as splitting. Then, electronuclear double resonance is an experiment where not only the electron is flipped, by a combination of microwave pulses, but additionally, because we now, in this, this, this pulsed spectroscopy, we have the time axis at our disposal, we can make a combined experiment where all of a sudden we also use a 180 degree NMR pulse to flip the nuclear spin by 180 degrees. This can be very advantageous uh, because it can simplify uh, it can simplify, I uh, see that the structure of the naphthokinone radical has disappeared from this transparency, unfortunately. It can simplify the EPR analysis really a lot. In EPR, we have seen that even for one nuclear spin two, we get already five, uh, five transitions. In this endor spectroscopy, the number of lines are much reduced, and we actually get, um, for example, for each set of equivalent protons, we get only two signals. So I'm sorry the naphthokinone picture has, has a home, but in naphthokinone there are three sets of equivalent protons, which were supposed to be called 1, 2, and 3, and each set of protons only give two signals. And the size of the hyperfine interaction, so how much these two levels here have come together, and how much the lower two levels have been pulled apart. The size of this hyperfine interaction can be directly measured by measuring the distance of the leftmost and the rightmost signal. Um, we have our A parameter that we can also in principle calculate by work. And this A parameter, the size of the hyperfine interaction, then will test the distance information. For example, in this, this um, protons, this, this set which I called one, you see that the two lines corresponding to one are actually quite far away. This means that the hyperfine interaction is strong. It means that the effective distance of the unpaired electron to these protons at one is, is closer. And there are two more sets, sets two and three of protons, where the electron is uh, effectively further away and the hyperfine interaction is smaller, and you see this directly in the spectrum because the two lines are much closer together. So we have the possibility experimentally to measure the hyperfine couplings directly, just like with G-values. So now back to theory. I'm now at the point where I want to discuss some examples. I have not talked yet about zero field splitting, just like with G values and hyperfine couplings, zero field splitting parameters can in principle also be measured and, and uh, derived directly from our EPR experiment. We have seen already pictures like this where uh, even in zero magnetic field, for example, for a spin one system, this leads to a splitting of the levels given by two parameters, T and E. One can uh, depending on the spin multiplicity and the size of D and E, one can actually make pictures like this. These have also been already discussed. And from an EPR spectrum measured on a triplet state, one can actually directly determine these parameters here. So I want to show you a little bit what we can learn just by measuring on triplet states in, in organic systems. And maybe, even though people uh, have talked about this already before, but I just want to remind you what zero field splitting is, um, in case you uh, are not completely clear about it. I try to summarize here several definitions. 
first one is from Wikipedia, which I personally like very much, but which one should not use, of course, <laughs> as a scientific reference. So zero field splitting, according to Wikipedia, is the various interactions of the energy levels of an electron spin larger than one half. So larger than one half, we need at least two unpaired electrons, even in the absence of an applied magnetic field. So that's quite clear. We need two electrons, and then we get the zero field splitting. This is from the book of Carrington and McLaughlin, slightly more complicated. Zero field splitting. The magnetic dipole, dipole forces between the unpaired electrons remove the degeneracy of the magnetic sublevels and lead to highly anisotropic spectra in most molecules. Basically, two magnets interacting with each other. Next book, Edderton, orange book. I don't know if some of the people here in the audience are EPR spectroscopists. This is one of the uh, one of the better books to learn EPR spectroscopy from. Zero field splitting reflects the dipole-dipole interaction, and or second order effect of spin orbit coupling. So for transition metals, where spin orbit coupling becomes important, then also spin orbit coupling contributes to the zero field splitting. We will limit ourselves now for organic triplet states, where spin orbit coupling is not so important. And lastly, I guess the correct definition from UPAC, very short one, zero field splitting is the separation of multiple sublevels in the absence of an external magnetic field. So what one can learn from zero field splitting? Again, distance information, I think I'll go over this mathematics now slightly quickly. We have seen that already for an electron spin and a nuclear spin. For two electron spins, it's exactly the same. So, this is the dipole dipole interaction between electron spin S1 and S2, with the connecting vector R12. One can reformulate this expression, one sees that one has S1 and S2 in something that looks like a spin Hamiltonian-like Hamiltonian where we have this, 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 this tensor quantity, uh, small d. In this case, we still have S1 and S2 on the left and the right side. If one goes a little bit more through the mathematics, one actually sees this for the level interaction trace of this tensor, so the sum of the diagonal elements is zero. And if we do further mathematical operations, we can actually uh, replace the microscopic, so the one electron spin operator by the spin operator for the complete system. And we get an effective Hamiltonian uh, for the zero field spinning, which is written like this, electron spin operator times this, this tensor here, this d-tensor, times again the electron spin operator. And the relation between the elements of this d-tensor, so i and j are just the x, y, and the z components of this tensor, is related to the magnitude of this dipole-dipole interaction and also to the orientation. In diagonal form, the uh, matrix, tensor is nothing more like a matrix, like I have already explained, this matrix can be written in diagonal form, where we again have these, these letters D and E that Eckhart was talking about. So, also the um, zero field splitting contains information about the distance between electrons. And moreover, if we measure just our EPR spectrum, indicated over here, we see that it doesn't really look like an absorption spectrum anymore. In the triplet state, one can actually have absorptive and emissive transitions. And I try to draw here, and I hope I succeeded, in three possibilities. Either the molecule is oriented in such a way that the magnetic field is parallel to the z-axis of the zero field splitting to the x or to the y-axis. If we now consider the case that the triplet was created in such a way that all population ended up in the ms equals zero sublevel. So population is indicated by these dots here. You see just by looking at the picture that we actually have 
two transitions that are possible for B parallel to C. We have an absorptive transition that comes first, and we have an emissive transition that comes at higher magnetic field. One can puzzle this together a little bit, and if one looks at all these, these six arrows in the figure for B parallel to Z, X, and Y, one can basically understand this, this, this polarization pattern, as it's called, of the EPR spectrum, where we have absorptive and emissive signals. And if an EPR spectroscope sees a triplet state like this, he knows, he or she knows that uh -huh, this triplet state is a triplet state that has been formed in such a way that all the population ends up in the MSS zero level. And that this is not a hypothetical example, I want to show you in the next transparency. This was actually a real spectrum already measured in 1979 by Marion Turnauer. It was a triplet EPR spectrum of the reaction center of bacterial photosynthesis. Just very briefly, the light is absorbed by this, this dimer of chlorophylls. It's the last time I make a picture in black. And uh, what actually happens when the light is absorbed by this dimer of chlorophylls, one goes from the singlet ground state of the dimer to a singlet excited state. And photosynthesis is a process where subsequently charge separation, um, charge separation occurs. So what actually happens is this excited electron that we have excited by light then subsequently, subsequently travels away from the special pair and travels to this chlorophyll, then to this pheophytin. So we get a separation of, of this electron pair that we started with by exciting one of the two electrons and then this electron just moves to a different cofactor and we have separated the two electrons. We can play a little bit of a game with this system, for example, by pre-reducing. So we put already electrons on this final acceptor, and then the electron that wants to go to the final acceptor cannot, because we have already reduced it. What then happens is that the charge separation, so the electron moves to the green chlorophyll, then to the blue pheophytin, that we get a P plus, P of 5 and minus, radical pair, where the two electrons are separated over quite some angstrom, and then the electrons do not really interact anymore as given by this distance information. So the spins are basically not correlated anymore. We uh, stated differently, we have a radical pair that can either be in a singlet state or the triplet state, and in time, since the spins are not correlated anymore, we have, in fact, both possibilities. And eventually what happens if we block the final acceptor, the um, two electrons recombine again, and they can actually recombine them with quite a high yield to the triplet state of the primary donor. And this is the EPR spectrum that you saw in the previous transparency. It's the triplet state of the primary donor. And the fact that all population was in the MS equals zero state is because we have this oscillation of the triplet and the singlet radical pair. So for the singlet, we only have an ms equals zero, so to say. And the, um, if one looks at the uh, in the magnetic field, how these energy levels look like, one sees for this radical pair state over here that the population, because of the degeneracy of the ms equals zero level of the triplet, with the singlet level, gets transferred back and forth, and in this way, the population ends up in the MS equals zero level. So from the polarization pattern, just the intensities measured in the EPR spectrum, you can already learn a lot about how this triplet signal came to be. We know also what happened previously to uh, when the triplet is formed. We see that there was a radical pair, a charge separation process, because all the population was in the MS equals zero level. I don't remember which of my colleagues already mentioned that the sign of D and E are very difficult to determine in general. Um, this is of course true. Um, in principle, we do not have access to the sign of D. Uh, 
whether it's positive or negative, we cannot really measure it. It would give technically the same, uh, the same VR spectrum. What we can do, however, since we now have our, our time axis here in the positive VR spectroscopy, if we are lucky, we can still determine whether T is positive or T is negative. I drew here the zero field levels again for a positive T, so the Z levels below and X and Y are above. What one can do is an experiment where we detect our echo, and of course we need a laser to bring our molecule, in this case C70, into the triplet state. And what we can then do is just vary the time between our uh, perturbation and our response. So we change this, this time here called tau dov, delay after flash. If we increase this time, we give the system time, we give the population time, for example the population in the upper triplet level, to relax back to the lower triplet level. So in time, as we wait longer and longer between laser flash and detecting of our signal, the population just goes from the top to the bottom level and it wants to be bottom up populated again. We can see this in the EPR spectrum. At short times, we have a triplet EPR spectrum which has absorptive and emissive signals. If we then start to wait longer and longer and longer, so this tau dove time becomes longer and longer and longer, what then eventually is measured is only an absorptive signal where most of the intensity is on the high field side of the EPR spectrum. If we now look into this energy level diagram, what basically happens is the population has decayed from the upper level to the lower level. So most of the population is associated with the lower level here. And this means that this EPR transition will be most intense and it will also be absorptive, which is exactly what we see in the EPR experiment. That the high field signal remains, it still has some absorptive intensity, and the low field signal, which was over here, goes away if we increase this delay after flash time. From this experiment, we can see that D has to be positive. If D would have been negative, then I would have to draw these two levels below the Z level, and then one would expect the low field signal to remain intense. So from such time-resolved experiments, we can even, in fortunate cases, determine the sign of D. The sign of D is um, rather difficult to interpret parameter because it depends on two unpaired electrons. It basically depends on two orbitals associated with these two unpaired electrons. In general, one can say that if the two unpaired electrons are close together and if the shape is, and I always forget, if the shape is rod-like, prolate, then D is smaller than zero. If it's more round and flat, for example, it is this chlorophyll dimer where two pi systems are directly above each other. If it's round and flat, then the D parameter generally is larger than zero. So one can of course also calculate these parameters. If one puts the structure of the molecule in the computer, one can calculate them, for example, with ORCA. And um, yeah, one has on the one hand the experiment, one has on the one on the other hand the calculation, and they are connected to each other by this construct called spin Hamiltonian. Just to give you one of my final messages, so anyone can run calculations today, it's still important to know uh, what the uh, limitations and what the possibilities of the typical, of the experiments that you are doing are. This holds for spectroscopy, for an experiment in the lab, but it also holds for the methods that we are using in the computer. These also have their strengths, but they also have their limitations. And that is our job as a scientist to know what the strengths are, and also very important what the limitations of the methods are that we are using. That this is important, I want to show you my final example, which concerns calculation of G values by DFT. 
Um, I hope that after this conference you have a better feeling about these pin and multi parameters. And still, I want to warn you, if you go home and if you do calculations of g-values, then you might get disappointed because the state of the art presently is that if one calculates g-values with density functional theory, then, uh, for example, this is a publication from Frank Nason from 2001. Um, and he said that significant disagreement between theoretical and experimental g shift still remains. So the world is not perfect. Be aware that also the methods in the computer have their, uh, have their limitations. They are all models. I've given you here an example, a particularly bad example, is titanium trifluoride. Experimentally, we have measured G-shifts on the order of minus 100, minus 120 part per thousand. If one calculates this either with pp 6 with p 3 lib with your favorite function also to say, you see that no matter which functional you are using, you are still quite far away from this minus 120 parts per thousand that you measure. The reason for that is, and this is this is something systematic, it doesn't happen for titanium trifluoride, it happens for many systems, that this agreement is unfortunately found, or the agreement is not perfect, let's put it like that. So please be aware of that. Um, we try to investigate what the cause of these, these discrepancies are. We don't know how to improve them yet. I think Dimitrios Mandanos is working on this. Uh, on this problem. Uh, what actually happens is that these transition energies, remember we have to do second order perturbation theory for G values. In second order perturbation theory you get this energy difference here in the denominator. This energy difference in the denominator is actually the cause of most of the problems. Again, this publication from, from Frank, in, this time in 2006. Most importantly, the calculated transition energies are all considerably overestimated, which leads to inaccurate, up to disastrous results for charge transfer transitions. Basically, what it says here is that these energy differences are overestimated. So if delta E is too large, then 1 over delta E is too small. So in general, you will calculate smaller G shifts than those you have observed experimentally. To show you how bad the situation actually is, um, we get a slightly more detail the titanium trifluoride. Titanium 3 plus is of course a P1 system. One can actually then do the calculation and to try to visualize here these orbitals. On the left side we have several of the doubly occupied orbitals. If one counts electrons, then the singly occupied orbitals actually orbit at 25, where you can nicely see that the SOMO is actually a dz squared uh, SOMO, so the unpaired electron is in a dz squared orbital. But nevertheless, the gx and the gy value of 1.88 are not reproduced at all by DFT, which gives 1.96, so the difference is quite far away. And since this is a small molecule, what we did is we tried to calculate this small molecule with several of the methods that are implemented in ORCA and that are being discussed also in the special interest lectures. If we try to calculate this, this energy difference, particularly relevant for this, this GX and GY shift, is the energy difference between MO25 and 26. And you can see how poorly DFT, or in this case time-dependent density functional theory, is actually performing. The overestimation of this energy difference is really can be factors of five or six, even one order of magnitude. If your delta E is one order of magnitude too large, then your one over delta E is one order of magnitude too small. So you can only imagine what happens to your G value. Um, there are other methods like complete active space SEF or coupled cluster methods that give much more accurate energies and energy differences. And we are presently, and with me, I, particularly Dimitrios Manganas, is working on a method that allows the same 
uh, let's say, ease of use of density functional theory, but it will give you much better energy differences, much better energy values. Um, for the moment, just to illustrate that honestly thinking, one cannot trust blindly the results that come out of the computer. One can correct manually by using this, this second order perturbation theory expression. All the numbers can be extracted from the EFT calculations nonetheless. So the spin densities or spin populations, I should say, of 80% and 90% of these two orbitals involved are relatively straightforwardly extracted from the DFT calculation. The spin orbit coupling parameter of titanium is known. You can find them in books. And then these small calculations, uh, calculations on this small molecule, give more accurate energy differences that one can just plug in. And in that case, the most accurate method is actually the de facto standard is CC SBT. If one plugs 5,000 wave numbers into this expression, one actually does get good results. So there are still systematic errors in calculations. Don't trust them blindly. And um, yeah, use your mind. Very important. And have fun with experiment and theory. And um, yeah, I think I will skip the last example of blue copper proteins. It's slightly more involved and it nicely brings together EPR and optical and MCD spectroscopy together with calculations. Depending on the complexity of the system, one can get good agreement for G values. And like I said, presently we are working on methods to make this easier for you. At the moment, especially for G values, be careful. So, thank you for your attention.